Welcome back to 50 Fundamental Chain Reaction Mechanisms. This is episode two in the series, and we'll be covering basic connects techniques. But if you haven't seen episode one yet, I recommend that you catch up, and you can click right here to go watch that. But without any further ado, let's begin with number 11, the rolling lever. A rolling lever is a horizontal lever where one arm is much longer than the other, and the longer arm has a wheel on the end that compensates for the imbalance of weight. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. You can clearly see that this lever is unbalanced. Maybe you're already thinking about ways that you could fix this, like perhaps adding extra weight to the shorter side, but I've found that this is finicky to get right, and personally, I don't think it looks very good. You might also think of adding a piece here that will pinch the connector in place and hold it in a perfectly horizontal position. But this will wear out over time, and this is also a very binary solution in the sense that it either works or doesn't. And as soon as it's a little bit imperfect, as soon as it slides even a little bit out of place, it's completely ineffective. So here's where the actual technique comes in. If we add a wheel to the longer side of the lever, we don't even have to worry about weight distribution anymore. And you can see here that it clearly works exactly the way that a lever should. You might assume that the weight of the wheel would also be problematic, because obviously anything that hits the lever would have to overcome the static friction to get the wheel rolling. And that's a reasonable concern, but turns out it works really well with light objects too. In this example, you can see that even just a small amount of very light plastic checkers are enough to push over a domino line. Number 12. Paired levers. Paired levers are two levers that are connected either by joints or by string, such that when one lever moves, that motion is mirrored in the other. So here's a classic example. Two levers connected by a string. When the ball hits one of the levers, that motion is transferred identically to the other lever, knocking the domino off the table. And like I said, you can also use joints to make paired levers, which would look like this. In this case, very similar. The actual practical application of paired levers is to navigate around obstacles, which I'll admit is a bit difficult to demonstrate in these small examples. But you could imagine how you could connect up two levers like this to transfer their energy really quickly from one place to another, even though there might be something in the way. And so far I've only shown you one possible orientation for paired levers, but it turns out you can get pretty creative with how you position both of the levers. For instance, it still works if you invert one of them. And here's that version using the joint method as well. Actually, I recommend using the joint method as a general rule because it actually will work in every situation. For instance, you can pull on a string, but you can't really push a string. So here's an example of a situation where the string method won't work. The next item on our list is the connects release. Now, connects release sounds pretty vague and it can mean a lot of different things. But for the purposes of this series, I'm going to define it using two specific pieces. So we're gonna get a little bit into the weeds here. A connects release uses either this tan piece with the little stick part being inserted into a hole, or this black piece where the top of it rests inside the slot of a connects rod. In the first example, we can see that inserting the tan piece into the hole is holding the ball lift in place. And of course, when a lever is removed, the ball lift goes up. This method will work in most cases, but it does tend to be vulnerable to vibrations. So if you're experiencing this problem, one of the ways you can fix it is by adding a small dot of hot glue onto the end of the tan piece. This should help provide just enough friction to hold it in place until, you know, it gets removed when the lever is pulled. If that's still not enough, or if the tan piece method is not a viable solution for some other reason, you can always try the black piece method that I mentioned earlier. I'm showing this mechanism in the context of one ball lift, but I really can't stress enough just how useful this mechanism is. I mean, I use it all the time. Anytime you need to hold something in place and then release it, this is a technique to consider. Number 14, offset lever. The basic idea of an offset lever is that it's a lever, where each of the arms is located at different points along the fulcrum. The offset lever is, I would say, primarily used vertically. We talked about in episode one how getting from a place of low elevation to a place of high elevation is usually a great way of replenishing potential energy. And the offset lever offers many different ways to do this. So let's take a look at some examples. In this first one, we can see how easy it is to get from a ball rolling very close to the table surface 
all the way up to a domino on a tall platform. Another combination that you'll see very often is an offset lever leading directly into a falling domino. Finally, it's actually very easy to release a ball directly using an offset lever. It's not impossible to see a horizontal offset lever. In fact, here's a great example of using one to lift a track from beneath. You can imagine how this wouldn't really be possible with a traditional lever because the other end of the lever would have to phase through the track pretty much. Maybe this is just pointing out the obvious because we are working with connects after all, but one of the highlights of the offset lever is its customizability. You can genuinely change every aspect of this to suit your needs. The height, the length of the arms, and the angle. Number 15, speed boost lever. In episode one, we talked about how a pre-toppled domino could be leaned up against the side of a ball to make sure that it starts rolling. And this mechanism is a bit of a variant on that that opens up a couple more possibilities. For example, if you need to get a really heavy ball rolling on an unsloped track, this method isn't the greatest. And sure, maybe you could play around with the weight of the domino or the height of the domino, but a better alternative is the speed boost lever. And of course, the speed boost lever will also work for all of the applications that we talked about before. Number 16, path splitter. A path splitter is a lever that redirects balls by rotating or toggling every time a ball passes through. This is undoubtedly a classic machine mechanism, and in this example you'll see exactly why it's so useful. The first ball hits the lever, and as it continues on its path, it rotates the lever. It pushes it to a new position, so that when the second ball enters, it's redirected to a new path. This is an example of a path splitter with a definitive endpoint. Like, if I were to put a third ball through, it wouldn't do anything different. It would just do the same thing that the second ball did. But you can also make a path splitter that toggles indefinitely. And here's an example of what that looks like. You can see that every ball just pushes the lever to the other side, effectively creating an infinite loop that toggles between directing balls to the left and to the right. Up next, we have a mechanism that's pretty similar to the path splitter, the counting lever. The difference here is that the counting lever is used to count the number of times that something has hit it and trigger the next step only after a certain number of hits. Here's a classic example of how a counting lever can be used. You can see the first ball passes through the lever and doesn't do anything except push the lever, and the second ball is able to knock the domino off the table, which triggers the next step. This particular setup actually has the potential to be a little bit annoying. One problem that you might run into is that the first ball is actually too powerful and is able to push the lever so far that it knocks the domino off early. One thing you can, of course, try is to just make the weight heavier, and you can see here that that does technically work, but it comes very close to failing. A better solution is, in conjunction with a heavier weight, to add a small ledge at the base of the domino to prevent it from sliding and only allow it to tip. The real potential of the counting lever is that you can customize the number of balls required to trigger the next step. In this example, I've made a lever that only pushes the domino off the table on the fourth ball. If you do make a counting lever like this, you might run into the same issue that I actually ran into while making this example, which is that the balls do tend to push the counting lever a slightly different amount each time. So you might have to get a little bit creative with how to achieve peak reliability. The solution that I came up with is adding a small piece here that actually secures the counting lever at each interval. And just to elaborate on a couple of other applications of the counting lever, so far we've really only looked at examples where multiple different balls are hitting it, but you can of course use this to count the number of revolutions of the same ball. Number 18, the balance swing. This is where you have a vertical 180 degree lever with a heavier weight at the top, and when an object hits the bottom, it swings around. The classic example of this is used as a ball kicker, where the ball hits the bottom of the lever, and the balance swing swings around to kick the ball, usually up a slope. But this exact mechanism can be used to accomplish all kinds of other motions, for instance, directing a force straight upwards, like in this example where a ball hits the base of the balance swing, causing it to swing around and hit another ball directly above it. You might be thinking, but a regular lever does that too. And you're right, and that might be good enough in some cases. But the real advantage of the balance swing is that extra energy boost that you get. For example, try using a regular lever to transition from a lighter ball to a heavier ball. It just doesn't work but a balance swing is able to accomplish this no problem. Another application of the balance swing is using it to pull a string, in this example, releasing a ball on a track somewhere. You might notice that this is very similar to how we used a falling domino back in episode one. 
Except the advantage here with a balance swing is that it requires a potentially much less powerful input. You see, if you use a falling domino, depending on the weight of the domino, you might need a pretty significant force to push it over. But with a balance swing, you only need enough force to knock it out of balance. One pretty unconventional use of a balance swing is to use it kind of like a lever. In this example, we have a lever that's going to be lifting a track, and we're trying to pull on that lever with a weight. But it's not heavy enough. Maybe we could make the weight heavier, maybe we could make the length of the lever different, or we could get a little bit creative. Instead of treating the lever like a lever, we could treat it like a balance swing by adding a heavier weight at the top and then balancing it there. Now, instead of needing a weight that's heavy enough to lift the track by itself, all we need is a lever that's heavy enough to lift the track by itself and a weight that's heavy enough to unbalance that lever. To recap, effectively what we've done here is translated the pretty minimal input force of a domino pulling on a string to a comparatively large output force that's actually enough to lift a track with a billiard ball on it. The next mechanism on our list is very similar to the balance swing, except it's horizontal. Allow me to introduce you to the overbalanced lever. A balance swing relies on the force of gravity to work, which is why it works vertically. But an overbalanced lever works horizontally, so we're going to use a string pull as our source of energy. So what is an overbalanced lever? Well, we'll get to some visuals in a second, but for now, bear with me as I try to describe it. You've got a horizontal lever with a string pulling on one of the ends, so the lever wants to move in the direction of that force. Except in one key place, when the force of the string is perfectly in line with the fulcrum. And that's the secret to why the overbalanced lever works. You can balance, so to speak, the lever in that specific location, and it only requires a very small nudge to move it slightly out of position. But once it's out of position, the force on the string takes over and moves the lever the rest of the way. Let's get to some visuals. First up, this is not an overbalanced lever yet, but this is an example of a problem that you might have. You can see that trying to transition from a very light ball to a very heavy ball using a regular lever just doesn't cut it. And here's the overbalanced lever, the solution to this problem. You can see that when the light ball hits the end of the lever, it nudges it out of place just enough to get the string to take over and pull the rest of the way. And you can tell how much of an energy boost this can give you. And just like you can adjust the weight of a balance swing, you can also adjust the energy that you can get out of an overbalanced lever by sliding the connection point of the string. One of the hardest things to do in chain reaction art across the board is convert from really small amounts of energy, like the force of a ping pong ball hitting something at very low speed, into lots of energy, lots of force. And the overbalanced lever is a tremendous method of doing this quickly and efficiently. In other words, the overbalanced lever allows you to have an absolutely astonishing ratio between the input force and the output force. And you can imagine how useful that can be. And to bring this all full circle, you can even use the overbalanced lever in the same way as the classic balance swing, as a ball kicker. Next on our list is number 20, the Kinex Rod Lock. The Kinex Rod Lock can come in many different shapes and sizes, but the one differentiating aspect is when you have a Kinex Rod sliding through a connector being used to release something. So here's what that looks like. You've got a connector here with a white rod in it and the white rod slides through the connector in order to release the gear. Where this mechanism truly succeeds is in its ability to hold back a ton of force. You can see in this example, we have a truly massive amount of weight pulling on the gear, and the Connects rod lock is able to hold it back no problem. And I say no problem because the mechanism itself isn't struggling at all to hold back that force, but the adhesive that you use to hold it to the table that might be a different story. So that's why I've classified this mechanism as hard, because you might not be able to get away with just using tape or hot glue. And for this example, I actually just used super glue. And again, I'm showing this mechanism in the context of only one application, but that doesn't paint the whole picture. The Kinex rod lock can be used in any number of situations, like holding back a tilting track, like this example from 8-Ball Machine. It's an extremely versatile technique, and it's one that I'm personally finding myself use more and more often. So those are the basic Kinex techniques, and that's it for episode two. In the next episode, we're going to be looking at string techniques. And if that episode's out by now, you can go click here to watch it. If you liked the video, leave a comment down below telling me what you thought. 
And if you'd like to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss the next episode, you can click right here. I'm Jack of All Spades 98, and I'll see you in the next video.